you, you are now about to witness the strength of street knowledge. Let's discover how a couple of months, but it's this, this, this enough for you to know what's up in the hood. Hi, I'm Cherokee Bailey. And I'm Emmanuel Reed. And, and this, this is Hardcover Hard News. Hey, what are ticket quotas? Good question. Ticket quotas are the minimal number of tickets to be distributed by a police officer. They are normally used to target minority groups. But are they illegal? Yes. In 1978, the Supreme Court ruled that issuing such quotas are illegal. They are illegal in most states and tend to get reported, but sometimes police groups like the New York Police Department have been known to issue illegal quotas. Are they illegal in the state of Illinois? In 2014, Governor Pat Quinn banned Illinois police departments from assigning quotas and assessing officers based on how many citations and tickets they issued. Wow, that's interesting, but even though that may be the case, there still seems to be a big problem with police brutality. What could be a reason for that? Well, one reason could be the Blue Code of Silence. What's that? The Blue Code of Silence is an unwritten rule amongst police officers. It's basically a promise saying that one officer will not report or snitch on another officer's misconduct. Right, so, uh, yeah, I get that. Mm -hmm. Um, so with the information you know now, how do you feel knowing that it's no longer serve and protect and instead it's really serve and make money? I have to admit it's a bit scary, but let's see what the people think. Hmm. We here at CTVN want to hear you, the teen voices of Chicago. Your opinions matter and we want to get to know the community of youth who was most suspect from abuse by the police. We recently had a chance to sit down and talk with Drake Matier, a resident of the south side of Chicago. He's here to offer, you know, insight on the topic. Well, when we think about the police quotas, we're basically saying that in order, it basically creates an incentive for the police to pull over, uh, especially minorities, disproportionately targeting minorities for tra uh, minor traffic violations. And when we create, when you have a quota system in place, you basically create uh, create a problem where now police are basically just looking to hand out tickets, looking to hand out uh, any violation possible in order to just get money. So it all becomes, so it's an incentive basically, it's an incentive. So the incentive now is not really to patrol and uh, protect and serve, but now it's an, the incentive is now to get money by using tra minor traffic violations just to get traffic tickets. What do you see in the community and personal experiences pertaining to police? Well, definitely in the black community what you have is you have a militarized police force as well. And I'm not saying that you see that just on a regular basis, but you do sometimes, a lot of times, see um, a militarized police where they're dressed in full body armor, uh, military militarized uh, weaponry. But also from personal experiences, I have been pulled over multiple times. Uh, not for anything really serious, but of course for a minor traffic violation, for example, like speeding, of course. But I've also dealt with stop and frisk. Well, there you have it. We hope you enjoy listening to these voices from the street. They definitely provide a great insight to the police quotas issue in Chicago. Once again, my name is Emmanuel Reed. And I'm Cherokee Bailey. Thank you for tuning in to Hardcover, Hardcover News. News. Go ahead, you go ahead. So, how are you? I'm good, how are you? I'm good. Have you, have you tried Pokemon Go? You have tried that the other day. It, it's, it's a good game. Mm -hmm. I've gotten to get you. Hey guys, so I was wondering if you guys could give me a little bit of advice. I'm trying to decide whether or not I should go to college. Hmm. 
Did you know many people ages from 17 to 20 have faced the pressure of enrolling in a university and going to college due to increasing stress being put on young people to go to college? The amount of students enrolled has increased from 44.1% to in 1989 to 57.3 in 2015. More specifically, in the United States, the average college tuition is $23,000. For out of for out of state residents attending public university, nine thousand for in state residents at public colleges, and thirty two thousand for private colleges. Because college tuition is expensive, many students and graduates are in debt with student loans. In 2012, 71 percent of students graduating from four year college graduated with debt averaging of twenty five thousand. As a youth myself who plans on attending college, debt could be jeopardizing my decision. With roughly 65% of Americans having to attend college and paying a minimum of around $9,000 per year, many high school graduates are debating whether or not colleges would be really worth it, considering the increase in graduates having to find jobs in their major. Many Americans in the U.S., after graduating with numerous degrees, search for a job within the field of major. However, the employment rate for college graduates ages from 20 to 24 this August was 10.8. For those with a bachelor's degree, the number was 10.6%, while those with a master's degree face a 17.2% employment rate. Of 41.7 million working college graduates in 2010, about 48% of the class of 2010 worked jobs that require less than a bachelor's degree. And 38% of those polled didn't even need a high school diploma. Okay, so do you guys have any other advice? Let's go ask our friends. Hey, my name is Dan Michal. I went to Columbia College, Chicago, started film and video. Uh, after going to college, to Columbia College for film and video, I didn't get a job in my field right away, however I got an internship with a film production company right away. Uh, my name is Yanet Sandoval and I'm 34 years old. I got my bachelor's degree in social work at UIC and in between um, getting my master, my bachelor's and getting my master's degree I also attended another university uh, called the Erickson Institute and I got a certificate or I got involved in a certificate program for um, a certificate degree in child development. Um, so I was working, I guess, working and going to school part-time on both uh, the certificate and the master's degree. Uh, I don't think that the degree is valued more than experience in education. I, it depends a lot, but I think a lot of times uh, real life experience uh, can matter even more than a degree so nonetheless a degree is important when for certain jobs you have to have a degree and obviously you have to show that you have a degree in the field but there are times when real life experience can be even more important um, in order to survive the, um, the workforce you obviously most jobs right now require you to have um, a degree. Most jobs won't hire you unless you have that bachelor's degree firsthand. And um, you also need the work experience. You know, when you first uh, finish your bachelor's degree, you actually need to either get an internship or some type of work experience throughout high school. It also helps, you know, to get some experience there. Um, and you also, you know, need that degree in order for them to hire you. So when you begin working, you're gonna probably not get paid what you want or what you hope for and you're probably not gonna get the job of your dreams um, so you know you're just gonna start getting experience so I think you need both. Uh, as far as transitioning from college into the real world and getting a job I was provided with some tips but I don't feel like you're 100% ready always from college you know so even though my education I think it was great I feel like yeah, it could be more help with transitioning from there to finding a job maybe um, 
I think it gives you some skills um, that you need, some basic skills, like, you know, obviously, you know, your, your math, your English, and some of those things. Um, it gives me, it gives you some tools, but not everything. Um, uh, for my master's degrees, this was more of a specialty that you actually know what you want to do with a master's degree. So it does give you more tools, and but you have to put it into practice. There's nothing compared to doing an internship and actual working and working with people, and that will give you the experience that you need to know what you're doing. Well, yes and no. So in the sense of... I feel like I did get a good education, so did I feel like I got a good information, a good education for my money? Yes. However, do I still owe money for my college? Yes, I still owe. I feel like it was too expensive. Unlike most of other civilized countries, we don't have free college here. College should be free and shouldn't simply be for profit thing yeah overall yeah I want to say as far as my education I went to good school I got what I wanted out of it so yeah it was worth it as far as having fun during college days yes it was worth it it was fun as far as how much debt I have ugh, it's painful and that no it wasn't worth it but then again had I not went to college, I probably wouldn't have the job that I have right now and so on and so forth, or missed on a lot of other opportunities. Well, college versus no college, it's still debatable whether or not you want to go. It's up to you. You could go to college. It depends on your lifestyle and how you want to better your future, so it's all up to you. Okay, thanks. Hello, I'm Alejandro. And I'm Lolito. And today we will be discussing the heated debate over whether gentrification within Humboldt Park and Logan Square has improved or destroyed the neighborhood. But you may be asking, what is gentrification? Gentrification is a general term for the arrival of wealthier people in an existing urban district, a related increase in rents and property values, and changes in the district's character and culture. The term is often used negatively, suggesting the displacement of poor communities by rich outsiders. Gentrification, it has its pros and cons. The gentrific gentrification of a neighborhood can raise values of property, increase the outward appeal, reduce crime rates, and attract middle class and affluent people outside of the city into the mentioned neighborhoods. Some downsides include the stripping of prior culture for residents who have made a home out of the community, long-time residents having to move into new areas due to the rise of rent, and higher pricing for establishments that have been long-time residents of the community. I'm Bianca Dodson, and I live in the Humble Park area. Um, my opinion in the Humble Park area is that it's crazy how it changed over the years. Now, there are so many new um, places, like condos and things are being built around our neighborhood and changing our neighborhood. And it's affecting me because it's raising our rent up and, you know, it's it's hard to see people that I know move out of the neighborhood because of how high their rent is. So I think that this should stop. <laughs> I think gentrification is good in doses. Um, 606 is kind of that point where any more is going to kind of ruin the culture the neighborhood has if there is any left. Um, but you know, that's the city's agenda. Some believe that it has Velasquez improved the community and making it safer and appealing to every Chicagoan. Luckily, um, the Bloomingdale Arts Building in which I live, it was a city-funded project and we have a grant to live there. And uh, what is it? Property tax is set at the rate in which we bought the place at. So, because we can still only sell it at the price we have it, we got it at. Um, so, I don't have that issue, but I know a lot of people in the neighborhood do. And I know uh, this year the property tax was raised significantly and a lot of people had to move out this year. Another community that has suffered the same effects of gentrification is Humble Park's neighboring residency of Logan Square. 
Recently, the Logan Square State Savings Bank on Logan and Milwaukee has been put up for sale. The sales price is between somewhere of two to three million dollars. This historic building is one sale away from being redeveloped and potentially being turned into condos, furthering the gentrification of the Logan Square area. Next to the California Blue Line train stop, a 12-story building is planned to be built. And even though the building will include low cost, some low-cost housing, the majority of the building will consist of one-room studio apartments with $1,500 rent, nearly double the average rent prices in Logan Square as of 2013. Honestly, I would do what Humble Park has done. Uh, even hu what Humble Park has done is not even that effective, but what Humble Park has done, they have a committee that regulates all of these things. They have people who speak on behalf of the people, the people who've lived there for generations, and I think that's honestly what any neighborhood in Chicago should do, because the only effective one I've ever seen to any degree is Humble Parks. But the bottom line is, is that in Logan Square, rents are rising, the ethnic mix is changing due to the shrinking of affordable housing, and it is a rapidly gentrifying neighborhood. Now back to the studio. Overall, gentrification has its pros and cons. Some believe that it has vastly improved the community, making it safer and appealing to everyday Chicagoans. On the other side, <clears throat> people believe that they have been kicked out of their homes and the community has been stripped of its prior culture in replace of what new residents consider to be a higher form of living. Now it is up to the local residents to voice their opinions on gentrification in order to find common ground on the topic. This has been Hardcover News. Thank you for watching. Welcome to Hardcover News. My name is Janelli. And I'm Axel. Today's news report is about minorities uniting against police brutality. Many of you guys have heard of the Black Lives Matter movement, but some have been questioning that all lives matter. However, throughout the years, African American people have been discriminated and recently many cases have been made about the deaths of black people. Recently, 32-year-old Philando Castile was shot and killed by a cop when he was trying to take out his license just like he was asked. And with this family witnessing his murder, black lives are taken for granted and overlooked. How can all lives matter if there is still the killing of unarmed black people? Many minorities ask questions about their own race, questioning how the media only focuses on one race, and Hispanics dying from police brutality in 2016. Throughout the years with many civil rights movements, minorities have come together with African Americans to fight for the injustices of our lives. Now let's go to Adam to see what the public thinks about this. We're on the 606 trail and we're here to interview people. My name is Nasut Musa Kafraye. I'm a student teacher at a master teacher partner Bab Yanun, AKA Dr. Malakazi York. Yes. Cause I'm a part of one. Uh, I'm a new Wapian, Wunu Wupu. Um, I know of Dr. Malakazi York. Um, I identity group that works or ending like that type of systemic oppression. Um, I don't know of uh, organizations that mix the two, but they stand in solidarity. Um, actually, at my school, there is there's actually a group called Five Plus One, which brings uh, Latinos together to fight um, off immigration or anybody like police going through um, police knocking on doors and saying, "Oh, you can't, you can't be here." because we're not minorities. And as long as we let white people tell us we're minorities, we're gonna to continue to be killed because it is based on a media that we have no control over. We've never had control over the media in this country. We have to remember that America is a racist society that's built off the eradication and the enslavement of people of color. So we can never be surprised when the media is in their favor. We gotta wake up to that. Because they really don't focus on us basically. I think it would make a change because uh, Latinos and African Americans are a big community, especially around here. And if we come together as one, it'll, we'll, we'll probably make a change. I think solidarity is really important. I think solidarity is definitely going to help us move forward. The power of one voice is so much and the power of many, many voices 
it's going to be even greater. And so two different groups, two oppressed groups come together in solidarity with one another's struggles. Uh, unarming the police, demilitarizing them. They, they, they move like military. They don't move like police. Black people are not, nor will we ever be considered United States citizens. We have to remember that. We are considered three-fifths of a human being chattel property. Native Americans are also qualified, classified, and identified as Negro colored and black, which is why they, the race tension between blacks and Latinos is actually frivolous because we the same people. Even Columbus recorded that in his log in 1654 when he first touched the shores of North America. So that's a historically documented fact. I would hope to see changes because uh, police um, police and the, also the community are just turning on each other and it's making everything worse on us and them because they don't really help us out and we don't want their help because we're too ignorant to accept it. If the public consistently demonizes people of color, like the darker your skin is, the more they're going to villainize you. Now that we got people's opinion, let's move on to Jocelyn. Thank you, Adam. There have been many deaths of minorities with 230 blacks and Hispanics, people dying due to police brutality. Through a study in Harvard University, police are 50% more likely to use force on Hispanics and blacks than white. We all need to question why that's happening, whether it's due to stereotypes or racial profiling. It needs to come to an end. Welcome back to the studio. What we have gathered about people's responses and Jocelyn's and statistics is that instead of making separate movements for Hispanics and African Americans, we need to come together and help our neighbor. I totally agree with you, but unfortunately, that's all the time we have for today. Remember, we can all change the world together. We'll see you next time in Hardcover News. Hello, welcome to CTVN Hardcover. My name is Raj. And my name is Kwaishan. Today we'll be discussing financial literacy. Financial literacy is the ability to understand how money works in the world, how someone manages and earns it. Society nowadays doesn't really focus on the importance of financial literacy. This leads to young adults who aren't capable of handling their own finances. According to a study taken on 2015, it was estimated that nearly two-thirds of Americans could pass the basic financial literacy test. Being that students are in school a third of the day, schools should emphasize the importance of financial literacy. Learning how to handle your finances helps you become a more independent and aware person. Despite 90% of teens claiming their parents were good financial role models, 40% of parents report having to sacrifice money going towards their child's education due to other economic issues. This goes to show that people already in their adulthood are not aware of efficient ways to manage money. Now let's get back to Isaiah and Alex with the public's view on financial literacy. How has high school prepared you to be financial capable? Oh, um, I, think fi I think high school really set in me um, in motion the fact that I wanted to be, uh, I wanted to, I think, learn more, be more educated, um, come out of it feeling like, um, you know, I could speak well and, and handle myself well with whether it's in business or whether it's in day-to-day -day life and things like that. Did you take a financial course? like a financial You know, I actually didn't until I was older, and I have to admit, now looking back on it, I wish I would have. Um, when I was in high school, I know things like that are, um, I don't know if it's so much required, but I, I know my kids, when they went through high school, had to take something like that. And I think it really helped prepare them, not only for college, but once they're out on their own and start talk, thinking about bank accounts and what things are going to cost and... Uh, mortgages and whatever, just for day-to-day -day life. I think it's really important to have that in high school. How confident do you feel with your financial? Um, I feel pretty confident. I've gone kind of changed careers quite a few times, but that's a good thing is that you can always um, change your career path. Um, but no, I think that I've done well for myself. I'm not the richest person in the world, but I, I live comfortably, and I think... It has a lot to do with being educated. Do you have any advice for young adults taking a literacy class? 
Literacy classes? Financial classes. That's okay, financial classes. <laughs> Absolutely take when you're younger. Um, now that I'm getting close to retirement age, uh, the things that I only probably learned like 10 years ago, I wish I would have known earlier to prepare myself better for something like that. Um, and again, just be able to live comfortably because you got to remember, um, love what you do, but I don't, I, I don't live to work, I, I really, you work to live, you know, and so consequently you want to, you know, if you know all those types of innuendos and stuff and, you know, the financial word and world and stuff that I think it just better prepares you to be able to do that and enjoy your life. Thank you for okay? your time. Thank you so much. How has high school prepared you to be financial capable? Um, I think uh, high school prepared me as far as go to college and how to apply for FAFSA. Now, in high school, I really didn't know what that meant, didn't know how much money that was, um, and I feel that's what a lot of people think. Did you take any financial literacy courses in high school? I did not take any financial literacy courses. How confident do you feel from on a scale from 1 to 10? Currently? Yeah. From my high school? To, I'm, a, I'm about a nine and a half right now. So I feel very confident now. I don't feel that high school prepared me for that, though. Do you have any advice for young adults that are planning to take financial literacy classes? Um, I do. Take notes and save, even if it's the smallest amount, save money now. And in those courses, understand why, in the long term, how much that's going to impact you down the road. Thank you very much. Yeah. Has high school prepared you to be financially capable? Uh, yes. Um, did you take a personal finance class or was one available when you were in school? Yes, there was. How important is it being financially capable and why? Um, very important um, because anything that you want to do, unfortunately the way that the world works is you need money and you have to figure out how to save it, keep it, spend it, donate it, do whatever. But um, it frees you up to do many things if you can keep your money under control. On a scale of one to ten, how confident are you in managing your finances? Uh, nine. Do you have any advice for young adults going into adulthood? Um, read the fine print <laughs> and um, learn the basics of math in terms of interest rates and things like that and do your best to stay out of debt. And if you can't, take care of it as quick as you can before other things. How has high school prepared you to be financially capable? Um, I think my high school has taught me more than just um, school stuff. I think it has taught me some skills that are going to be very useful for when I grow up. And I have to, you know, be on my own and do my financial things. So yeah, I think my school has prepared me very well. Okay. Did you take a fina personal finance class or was one available to you? When you no, it was not available. Would you have liked to? I would, totally, yeah. I think it's uh, convenient and it's helpful and I think everybody should be able to have that possibility, you know? Um, how is it? How important is being financially capable and why? I think it's one of the most important things. I think financial skills in um, everyday life are so important because everything that you do depends on those skills. So I think they are very important and I think everybody should be able to master them. On a scale of 1 to 10, how confident are you managing your finances? I think I would say uh, I'm an 8, but I totally wish I could be higher. Do you have any advice for young adults going into adulthood? Um, I would just say go to school, study, get advice from adults because they really know what it's all about. And yeah, just try to learn and don't think you know it all. Only 14 states in the U.S. require high school students to take financial literacy courses. There are only a handful of high schools that provide their students with financial literacy courses such as Jones and Aspire Business and Finance High School. There are different websites where you can get certified in financial literacy. An example of this is EverFi, which offers a certification with nine modules consisting of savings, banking, payment types, credit card scores, higher education, owning versus renting, insurance and taxes, High interest tax and consumer protection that will help young adults to be successful in the future. Now that you have gained information about financial literacy, we hope this teaches young adults the importance of it. This is CTVN Hardcover. And again, I'm Raj. And I'm Kwe Thank you for watching.